our artist talk tonight with Yvonne Kustek. Um, my name is Shauna Thompson. I'm one of the curators here uh, at Esper Foundation. Um, before we embark on our conversation tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Kani, and Guyana First Nations, the Sutena First Nation, and then the Nyahe Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, I'd like to encourage all of us today um, who are present here today to take some time um, to reflect um, tonight and every day on your relationship to the specific lands on which you live on and, um, and your relationship to the people who have lived there and continue to live there alongside you. Um, I guess just a couple of housekeeping items tonight. Uh, tonight's talk will last approximately 45 minutes, uh, followed by questions from the audience. Um, please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to address as many of those as possible um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will not be using the chat function or the raised hand function during this program, but if you are having any technical difficulties, you can message us using the Q&A function or um, you can email Eva, who will be monitoring her email during this talk, at everity at escrofoundation.com. Um, if at any time you lose connection for any reason, you can log back on using the link uh, in your confirmation email. Um, and please note that this talk is uh, being recorded. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Yvonne Kustik is a Calgary-based artist originally from Oakville, Ontario. She attended AU Arts, formerly ACAD, majoring in sculpture and graduated with a BFA with distinction in 2011. Kustik employs various hand-building techniques with clay to produce figurative sculptural work in which nature works as a metaphor for both transformation and regeneration. Her work merges flora and fauna with the body to reclaim it from patriarchal traditions, institutions, and ideologies. Through her sculpture, Acoustic works to deconstruct the symbolic nature of femininity and to redefine historical narratives. Uh, Acoustic is currently an artist in residence at Medalta in Medicine Hat. Her current exhibition, The Garden, will be viewable in the Esker Foundation project space until June 6, 2021. So if you have a chance to come by, even though the gallery is not open, you can view this very amazing installation from the street. So uh, please do come by and visit us there. Um, Thank you all again for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, and I guess now I'll just throw it over to Yvonne. Welcome Yvonne. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I want to extend that thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight for this talk. I'm really grateful for you taking some time to hang out and listen to me speak about my practice and the making of this work. Uh, a huge thank you to the Esker for the opportunity and support in making uh, the work for the garden. And also a huge thank you to Medalta for providing uh, the space and the support as well um, for making this work during the period of, or over the course of two different residencies. Okay, so I'm going to start here. So uh, this piece is pivotal uh, in my journey, um, not only because it's the maquette for the figure um, in the garden, but it's also it also marks a return uh, to making for me. So uh, I had, stopped making work for quite quite a period um, in the sort of mid or 2000s, uh, to, or after I had graduated. Um, but here I'm marking return to getting back into the process of making. It also marks a recognition and acknowledgement um, that at the time I was really paralyzed by grief and loss. And I had lost sight of myself and my art practice. So uh, in 2017, I picked up some Sculpey, had a makeshift uh, basement studio, at home and started working on this piece. At the time I was um, having art nights with a, with a friend of mine and we were potentially talking about collaborating. But anyways, this is the beginning of, of a refresh for me personally and in my art practice. Okay, so moving forward, um, later in the year, uh, in 2017 still, I took a sabbatical, a uh, personal sabbatical, which is the first time that I had sort of taken a break for myself. Um, this was meant to be a time for me to step into a place of healing um, and also to get back into my art practice. So I was lucky enough to find a space at Workshop Studios in Inglewood. Um, and the beginning of that process of me um, returning to the studio was sort of working in old ways and old processes and familiar materials. Um, and I found 
that worked really well for that maquette that we just saw on the last screen. But sort of after that piece, um, and I was just playing around in the studio, none of that really seemed to fit or make sense anymore. So I was struggling for a bit in terms of how to move forward and what was going to happen next in my studio. But sort of randomly ended up taking a clay sculpture class at Wildflower Art Center um, in 2018. And that was such a wonderful experience for me. And luckily, actually, as a sort of funny side note, the class was almost canceled because uh, there's only three of us in the end, but I was able to switch times. So the class still ran, which was really great. And the fact that there was only three people um, just gave us more space uh, and time to work. So I had worked with clay previously um, in older work, but that had only been through slip casting uh, and mold making. So this was a complete sort of new direction for me in terms of trying to sculpt um, from clay. And so in that class, I learned, well, I started off with making the hands and then we migrated to uh, working on the face. And I really, really enjoyed sort of the process of sculpting with clay. Uh, and the instructor, unfortunately, I don't remember her name, but um, she was a traditionally trained artist who was originally from Europe. And I really liked her sort of strict sense of working. And I really sort of took that back into my own studio practice. Um, at workshop. So that class was so inspiring that I decided to try playing around with clay more in my own studio. I even purchased myself a clay sculpture book, um, which was all about sort of making, making the face. So as an extension also of that first pair of hands that I made on the right hand side, it was another set of hands that I, I worked on. And I'm starting to get more of a feel for clay at this point. Um, and the face is starting to look a little more naturalistic. Uh, the hands though, I was interested in them not just being um, plain as they were. I wanted to play around with texture. Um, and so I just started randomly carving them, which was something that I had never done before. And this is sort of what happened. So I started off with that pine cone texture at the top and then migrated towards the leaves at the bottom and sort of was really happy uh, with the look of those pieces. So I did pause here and there with trying to sort of return to old ways of making um, the sculpy flowers that you see in the middle and on uh, the right hand side um, was an attempt to me to return to old ways of making. Um, but then I decided to try the working with nature elements um, in, in clay specifically. Though at this time, um, I started to think more about the flowers being more naturalistic. So I did make myself some handmade um, cookie cutters for the petals and wanted to play around with flowers that were um, sort of more, more layered as we could see here uh, in these examples. Now, um, on a personal note, what was also shifting for me was this um, introduction to a love of gardening. Uh, I grew up in a home with a mother who was an extensive gardener, both with vegetables and flowers. But as a child, to be honest, it was something that I, I didn't have any interest in whatsoever. But in this new, um, this new phase, this phase of healing, um, this phase of reflection, I really, um, felt like I was drawn towards putting my hands in soil and tending to plants. So this is my first garden at my former home um, in Bridgeland here and it just took and I really enjoyed this process uh, of getting into gardening and tending to these beautiful little plants and then the result um, and those two bottom pictures that you could see are my beautiful, my beautiful vegetables that I got out of this process. So this was a nice shift um, that was also happening for me personally. And then also at the same time, um, I started to get out and explore uh, more, more of Alberta. Um, I've been here uh, since 2008, but to be honest, I never, I mean, aside from like, you know, going to go visit Banff and doing, you know, some adventures here and there, but I wasn't, to be honest, much of a hiker by any means. But as an extension of my interest um, in gardening, I wanted to spend more time outdoors because I found that so rewarding. Um, and that connection to nature felt really healing. So this is also happening in the background. Um, I have some really great adventurous friends who took me to places that I probably never would have seen on my own. Um, and then seeing parts of Alberta that I hadn't explored before uh, was a really cool experience for me at that time. <clears throat> 
And then, so here is where I'm recognizing that I want to sort of so, uh, focus on clay only. Uh, I recognized, uh, like I mentioned before, that sort of past material explorations had sort of served their purpose. And um, this connection to clay uh, was really interesting to me. I really loved the material and I wanted to sort of push it more and figure out what I could do. That background or that outside work of me spending more time outside was starting to work its way also into my studio. Um, I had started off making flowers that maybe looked a little more graphic um, with sort of thicker petals. Um, but then I'm noticing that I'm wanting to shift to sort of more naturalistic and more naturalistic look um, to the shape of the petals. So I made a variety of additional shapes to work with. And then I'm also starting to push the sort of thinness of the material, uh, which was start, which was also a really interesting thing to me because I was sort of a baby beginner in terms of working with clay and I didn't have a ton of knowledge about the material itself. But here I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm getting more interested in exploring the material itself and seeing what it's capable of and what I can do with it. Okay, and so this is the first bust series, uh, the, bu the first bust I made out of a series of three. And at this point, I'm wanting to connect the floral work that I had been doing to the figure itself. In past work, um, before clay, I had done uh, a body of work that involved figurative pieces and I had played around with flowers on the surface of the skin, but this um, seemed like a sort of a new direction outside of that in terms of me wanting more of the figure to be shown. In the past, I had generally, I'd always co uh, completed, covered completely the figure um, in texture, but now I'm wanting to have parts of the skin and face revealed and this interest in working in a more realistic fashion, um, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed making work and figuring out how to build uh, a more realistic figure, basically. I'm not really sure of where sort of the cherub influence though, in terms of the face that you see in the corner. I wasn't actually looking at any reference image when I was doing these. It was just trying to build a face. Um, uh, I don't even, uh, there was no specific influence for, for the face that I was doing. And my, sorry, my cat is trying to jump up on <laughs> my table here. <laughs> okay, so this is the second bust that I worked on. Now, I had really enjoyed in the first piece that more of a reveal of the face itself. So I wanted to push that even further here. Um, and I was also interested in trying to sculpt hair because I had, okay, sorry, I just, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I had been doing some research um, in terms of other figurative ceramic sculptors out there, and I was really fascinated by the look of hair sculpted out of clay. So I wanted to try my hand at that. Um, and also, instead of having the majority of the face covered in the floral work, I wanted sort of just pops. Of, of flowers around the neck there and the head, but the full reveal of floral of the flower work to be around the back so that the viewer had to um, walk around the piece to see the details. And uh, now the hair was added much later in the process of making this piece. So I had worked with wig hair um, in previous work, but that was just me basically sort of placing and gluing a full wig uh, onto a sculpture. And so this is a new direction in terms of working with hair and layering it. Um, I finished this piece actually interesting. Um, it was only during this current residency that I'm doing over the last couple months that I actually finished it. I felt for the longest time that this was complete, but the more that I looked at it, um, the more I just, I knew it needed a little bit more. So the hair uh, that I added at the end finally completed the, the piece for me. And so, this is the third bust that I made. Now, um, at, at this point, I recognized that I wanted to push the scale um, and sort of the pose that I had been comfortable with in the first two pieces. I also, Rufus, okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. He's normally never this interested in sitting on my lap, but he obviously knows that I'm doing something right now. So he wants to be a part of this talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, 
I recognized at the time I was definitely um, struggling sort of personally. I, um, I was sort of questioning my identity in different ways. Um, and so that was sort of reflected uh, in this piece. The mushrooms were a newer interest. Um, I had focused solely on sort of floral work and combined with the figure, but now I was sort of, I was extending outside of that to work with, uh, to work with fungi. Um, personally at the time also, there's an interesting connection is that I'm starting to get more into tattooing. So another influence for me um, for the fungi is Heather McLean, who is the artist who did both of my sleeves. She does these incredibly beautiful figures combined with flora. And that was definitely also an inspiration for me um, at that time. So the hair that I did start originally when I was sculpting this piece um, wasn't as successful as, as I wanted after it had been fired. So this was the first bust piece out of those series that I actually then used wig hair to complete, uh, to complete the piece, which I really enjoyed the process of. Um, and I wanted to extend that idea of the hair sort of feeding into the mouth, um, which worked really nicely with um, adding the, the wig hair uh, layer by layer. So also interesting for me is this um, exploration into functional work. Now in the past, um, I'd only dabbled uh, with making functional work and that was only through um, slip casting. But now since I'm becoming obsessed with hand building, I wanted to push that and see what type of um, functional work I could make. And it was sort of another means for playing around um, with that floral work and seeing how I could uh, adorn the surface um, of these vessels as well as uh, the tile shapes that I was working with. I started with the tiles um, and then migrated up towards uh, the vessel once I was feeling sort of more comfortable with that idea. Um, and I liked, carrying over this idea of the flowers appearing like they're growing around the surface um, of the vessel. So, which was something that was interesting to me in terms of the way that they had been placed onto the bust pieces in uh, that you saw earlier. Okay, so this amazing opportunity for me in terms of having an Esker show secured, um, meant that I was ready to step outside of sort of, I guess, past experiences. And I applied for my first ever residency and was accepted into Medalta. So in September of 2019, I started at Medalta. It was originally supposed to be for uh, three months, which I ended up extending for four. Um, and this is sort of the beginning of me um, getting into the headspace of this new residency experience. We have a photo here of two of the beehive kilns, um, which were amazing. And on the inside of the gallery, you could actually walk into them. It's a very cool experience. Um, and then of course my first ever selfie to mark uh, this beginning, <laughs> this new experience for me during this residency. So this is my studio here. Uh, this is obviously at the beginning as uh, you can tell, cause it's clean um, and very sort of organized still. Uh, which changed very quickly uh, once I get, got into the process uh, of working. Okay, so at the beginning of this residency, um, I definitely struggled with getting started. Um, I recognized that I think I'd put a lot of pressure on myself in terms of what I um, wanted to make um, and the skill building that I knew was going to be attached to that. So I wasn't really sure how to get started. So the easiest thing for me um, to step off of was what I was familiar with. So I did start with making flowers again, but I, I wanted to push um, the scale of that as well as um, the detail in terms of the flowers that I had made in the past. So uh, this chrysanthemum here or chrysanthemum inspired flower uh, was one that I hadn't made before. Um, and sort of the meticulous nature of doing these, these petals round and round and round um, sort of really helped me to start to focus uh, and move forward in terms of um, the grand scale of what I needed to do and get started over the course of that, uh, that residency experience. So um, I continued on that vein um, and kept making flowers. 
um, on a larger scale than I had done in the past. Uh, I was playing around with a bunch of new petal shapes, uh, which I really enjoyed. These were more multi-layered um, flowers than I had done in the past. And again, sort of this process, it's just really meticulous and meditative. And I, I really enjoy just sitting, um, making these petals over and over, placing them around and around, making another uh, round of petals. Um, it's, I, I, re I really enjoy the process of making these flowers. So the other cool thing for me at this time um, is this shift into buying um, good tools for my studio practice. So that blue wheel that you see there is my first Shimpo wheel, um, which was a game changer. It was cool to acknowledge that I was giving myself space to buy the tools that I needed for my practice um, and good quality tools that uh, will allow me to do the work that I needed to do. I had a lot of great little hand tools and whatnot, but um, anyways, the Shimpo wheel uh, is one that I use almost daily in my practice. And uh, it's been a great addition um, to the tools that I currently have now. Okay, so aside from the awesome experience of uh, the studios at Medalta, what I love so much about Medicine Hat is the rich history of production in this city, um, specifically clay. Um, and we as artists are very lucky in that we get to go tour the Highcroft facilities, which is an old um, production site here in Medicine Hat. It's just down the street um, from Medalta and it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place. So um, it was hard for me to pare down the photos because my, my talk isn't about me exploring um, the Highcroft site, but as someone who has spent years interested um, in mold making, um, seeing all of these old molds um, and the ghosts sort of in, of production past in this amazing space um, was a really cool experience. Um, and you know, you get a sense of sort of where people finished sort of their last job as when the uh, factory was closed down and they just left and, and, and sort of that was it. And so here are just a few more photos of different parts of the factory. They have um, oh, boxes and boxes and boxes of old production wear of uh, different types of items, um, housewares, um, sinks, toilets, um, which was one of the most interesting and fascinating parts for me of this tour, uh, I was obsessed with the toilet molds. Um, they're beautiful objects. I guess at the time it, it also seemed interesting because I don't think I'd ever considered the idea that they were handmade objects, which was a, a really interesting thing to think about. But anyways, we're, um, as artists, we're, we're very lucky to be able to access this space. Um, and we also have the opportunity to use some of the molds from their historic collection um, if we'd like to in our own press in our own practice. So at this point in the residency, um, I recognize that I'm feeling a lot more comfortable um, in my own space. Um, and so I wanted to push what I had been doing further by combining different elements of flora and then working in a greater detail than I had before. So this was um, the most elaborate tile piece that I made while I was there, working with different, um, a variety of different types of, of flowers. And that was the first time I'd ever actually made little chrysanthemum bub, um, little chrysanthemum buds, sorry, uh, at the top there. And also this was um, a fun experiment in terms of sort of exploring mushrooms in a different way than the, the fungi collar on that uh, third bus piece that I showed you uh, previously. Okay, so now this is the baby beginnings of the figurative piece. Um, I knew that this was gonna be a massive learning curve for me. Um, I had built a life-sized piece in the past, um, but using much different processes and materials. So I have experience um, hand building with clay, but not to the level um, that this full size piece was going to require. So Medalta also has this lovely library uh, that artists can access um, with a variety of books, um, which is super useful. So I had looked through um, a couple of sculpture books to help me get going, um, but mostly I just, I, I winged it for the beginning. 
so um, for hand building, um, I started with the feet. So basically it was just two chunks of clay. Um, and then I carved out the shape of the feet and then worked my way up uh, the legs. So I work with slabs generally um, in most of my work, but I knew that um, slab work wasn't gonna be just the most, the only way that I was gonna be able to build this. So uh, for the first time I got into coil building. So these pieces were built through uh, a combination of slab building and coil building, um, a ton of trial and error. So I would start um, on one foot on one side, work my way up to a certain point, then try to mirror and mimic that on the other side, which was a, a great way of learning. This, the, the idea of the muscle memory that our hands develop um, was very helpful along the process. It was sort of funny to fumble through one side, but then instantly be comfortable on the other side um, as I was moving forward, uh, which was very cool to experience. Now, the, the funny part is the way that I have supported these legs here. You can see I have full boxes of clay in that middle piece that she's resting on. Um, and then towards the right-hand side, I have those big um, pieces of foam that she's resting on as well. And that, that worked up into a certain point until I got to the waist, when the weight of her legs um, wasn't going to be able to support it with those structures that I had. So um, I also pulled my back out in that process because moving those heavy 50 pound boxes of clay up and down and around to reposition them as I was working my way up uh, while bending over um, wasn't the best route that I took in terms of making it. But anyways, in terms of this learning curve, it was something that I needed to go through moving forward. So. I went back to the library at Medalta and looked through more sculpture books. And lo and behold, the beauty of the armature was going to save me moving forward. So um, that example of a that figurative piece with the armature behind it um, was my inspiration moving forward. So I had to rethink um, that process. And that involved multiple trips back and forth to Home Depot and a bunch of plumbing parts that I sort of rigamajigged here um, into this armature, which in the end was very effective uh, for supporting the piece um, moving forward. But I definitely had to rebuild the top um, because of the way that it was supported previously with just the boxes and the foam, it wasn't able to hold itself up. So it ended up cracking, but um, rebuilding it wasn't a huge deal um, in the end. Okay. So the fun part now is covering the surface uh, in, in the flora. I was introduced to the idea of the damp box through one of the other artists. And then luckily I was gifted one by um, a resident who was leaving um, at the end of her residency and didn't need to take it with her. So she gave it to me. Um, and a damp box is a plastic box that has a layer of plaster on the bottom that you just soak with water. So it allows you to put um, your ceramic pieces in there and keep them moist while you're working with them over a period of time, instead of drying out or wrapping them in plastic. It's a super useful uh, tool. So the process which I decided um, to follow through with was making as many components as I could at a single time so that I had access to a variety of different types of flora that I could just play around with positioning um, on the figure itself. So at this point, I didn't have, to be honest, a specific plan. It just sort of came to me um, as I was working in terms of what, um, what plants uh, that I wanted to work with. So the leaves seemed to stick out for me at this time um, and then the mushrooms as well. So that was what I focused on for the lower half of the figure. Now, when it came time to actually putting them onto the surface of the figure. Um, I know that I did struggle because I didn't have a plan specifically. I, I wasn't really sure uh, how I wanted to address covering the surface. So it took me a few days to figure out how to get started on that. But once I placed that first leaf on sort of her inner thigh, then it all started to make sense and everything just flowed from that point on. Um, 
and then they those pieces just continued to speak to other pieces and then I was able to to finish covering the legs with the uh with the flora so here is the piece completed um I was really excited to get to this point. Uh, there was a few moments where it was actually a little bit unbelievable that I was able to, to achieve uh, the building of these legs, but it was, a, it was a really amazing process to go through. Um, and so we just have a, a view from the top. <laughs> I spent a lot of time working on top of my desk, which isn't really traditional uh, in terms of working, but due to the scale of the legs um, and me being new to this process, of working to the scale with clay. Um, this is just how it worked in, in my studio. So uh, one of um, such a cool aspect of, of the residency experience is uh, getting to know and work with the other artists who are there. And I find the clay community so engaging and amazing. Um, everyone that I've met through my experience uh, at Medalta uh, is, is so generous with their time and their knowledge. And I've been lucky to learn so many new things through their various experience. Um, this is one of those moments where um, I tried something because of a suggestion from another artist, uh, which I don't think I would have come to on my own. So I was introduced to China paints uh, through my, one of my studio mates, um, John at the time. I had experienced, um, a glaze fail in, in, in a firing in terms of the colors not popping as much as I thought they were gonna pop uh, originally. Uh, I work with underglaze exclusively in all of my work, um, but I was super disappointed that they didn't come out as I had hoped. So my studio mate, John, suggested I try China paints, uh, which why not, of course I'm there. So I decided to try it. Um, and I didn't really have extensive knowledge by any means of how to work with them. So I just kind of winged it. And it was a really cool um, process. And I ended up with this result, which was totally unexpected, but really fit, um, especially with the mushrooms, that sort of naturalistic look of mushrooms um, was a happy accidental result in terms of exploring this new way um, of finishing ceramics. And the flower as well, um, it's sort of just a light marking, but being able to play around with that, that fleshy color a little bit more and add more of a naturalistic feel through the use of the China paints was a really cool thing uh, that I was exposed to. That from that point on, I continue to use uh, in some of my work because I really enjoy uh, the look of China paints. Okay, so now um, it was time for me to work on the top half of the figure. And again, um, in terms of my, my skill and experience, there was gonna be a, a big learning curve for this process, but I felt a lot more comfortable because of um, the completion of the legs. But I wasn't quite prepared um, for the fact that I was gonna struggle through this process uh, sort of as much as I did. But again, it was uh, a huge uh, bonus for me to go through um, this process of learning. So this was the first bust, which I knew pretty early on uh, wasn't going to work um, in terms of the way that it was built, but it was a really good opportunity for me to study the top half of the figure. Um, for the figure in the garden, I had reference photos um, that I had just downloaded online, but again, there was no specific person or model that I used um, as reference for the piece. I just wanted to approach it um, without any specific vision of a person in mind and just sort of let it naturally come together uh, through the process of working with the clay. So again, this, this piece didn't end up working out as the top half, but it was a really good opportunity for me to play around um, with building and figuring out um, the body and how I was going to move forward in terms of actually making the top hat. And then as well, when we see the finished piece at the end, it was another opportunity for me to start playing around with flora on the surface um, of the figure. And as well, the addition of the snakes um, was an idea that I had for the figure in general. So this was a nice opportunity for me to play around in terms of introducing um, the snake element 
to the figure. And so this is bust number two um, that I had assumed that again was going to be the top half. But uh, once I got to sort of just above the chest, I realized again um, that this, I, I hadn't quite built it right for it to be fully realized as the top half. But I had such good success in terms of using the first piece as a study. Um, this was another great opportunity um, to play around further uh, with layering flora um, and fauna on the surface um, of, of the bus to see how that was gonna work moving forward for the top piece. Um, I hadn't combined elements, different types of flora um, on the surface like I had in this, this study piece here. So it was really fun um, to figure out how that was gonna work and merging different types of flora together on the surface of the skin. This was um, my first introduction to adding a braid onto the surface of the skin, which was really lovely because it just nicely sort of fit along the sides of the ribs there. Um, but a great, a very useful um, exercise in terms of learning um, during this experience of making the piece. Okay, so by the third piece, um, I felt ready. I knew this piece was gonna work out. So uh, here she is um, up until the neck. Um, I had learned a lot, obviously, in terms of the process of making the first two study pieces. So um, I just continued with what I knew um, and sort of had solidified a better way to build the internal supports. Um, these are mostly slab built. I was successful in coil building and combining coil building and slab work for uh, the legs, but the bust required more um, slab built work than, um, than coil building. So for me personally, um, as I'm mostly hand, or I'm sorry, I'm mostly self-taught in terms of hand building, um, it was sort of really cool to figure out what worked and what didn't during the process of making this piece. Um, but again, this, this one I was mostly focused on um, slab building for making the top half of the figure. Okay. So now I've gotten to the point um, where the arms have been added as well as the head and you get to see Yvonne's patented figure wrapping technique um, with plastic <laughs> on, on the right hand side there. Um, in terms of the pose, it was definitely influenced um, by the maquette, but I allowed for space for that to shift and change um, as sort of I saw fit sort of day by day there was sort of new influences that were merging their way um, into the work. So I just really listened to sort of what was happening around me as well as sort of the clay also demanding um, or asking or telling me what it needed. So um, in the original maquette, the head was bent back quite a bit further um, and I didn't push it as far in this piece. Um, and I was, really I was really happy with that choice. Um, and now to show you sort of the internal workings of the sculptures, um, I spent a lot of time building structural supports on the inside. Perhaps maybe I went too far uh, in terms of building these supports, um, which I learned some lessons later down the road in terms of the multiple firings that the pieces had to go through. Um, but it was, a, it was a really cool process to sort of problem solve how to support the piece internally because I knew um, the weight of the clay as well as the layering of the of flora and fauna on the surface of the skin was going to put pressure on the outside. So I wanted to make sure um, that internally the piece was supported so it could make it through the various firings, as well as because of the scale of the piece, um, the internal supports uh, were necessary to make sure that the clay could hold itself up as I got to the top um, of the piece, including the head. Okay. So the fun parts, um, here is um, the point where I've added now the hands and we have the details of the face coming together. Uh, the hands were uh, modeled after my own hands there, um, which was just a choice at the time in terms of learning um, 
the process of making these more realistic hands than I had done in the past. Um, I, I'm my own great model uh, in terms of having a reference always on hand uh, in the studio. Um, and the face again, there was no specific reference um, for her. She just naturally came together. I feel though, when I was thinking about it, that there's probably some sort of inspiration from maybe traditional uh, marble sculptures. There seems to be sort of a classical look in terms of the approach that I use to um, creating the face. But there's no, again, um, there was no desire for me to specifically reference one person because I didn't want the figure to just be reminiscent of one person. I wanted sort of more of an every, an everyone, an every lady um, visible, um, or to make that connection to it, it just not being one specific person. Okay, and now um, I'm at the point where she's completed, the sculpting is done. Um, so I'm ready to add um, the flora to the surface. I decided to start at the top, um, her neck specifically. Now the maquette had also included braiding um, around the neck and that just seemed like the first place uh, for me to start. So I, was also at the same time that I'm refining um, sort of the, the facial features of the sculpture, um, as well as continuing to add the flora piece by piece with uh, sort of a similar connection to the legs in terms of not having a specific plan. The flowers seem to speak to me uh, in terms of the positioning that they wanted and where they fit most. So I just kept following along that line of letting one flower speak to the next in terms of where they were positioned um, around the face and the rest of the figure. I did know specifically though that I wanted sort of this grandiose chrysanthemum crown um, on her head. I just liked the idea of these bursting flowers uh, that appeared like they were growing um, out of the out of her forehead. Um, and so that was that spoke to me. Um, pretty intently during the process of, of layering the flora onto the figure. And here she is completed. So I stepped away from fully covering her completely in, in flora and fauna. Um, originally, again, the maquette was covered in uh, completely in flora. Um, but in this new direction in terms of um, working with clay and the bust that I had done previously, I wanted to have parts of the body visible. I didn't wanna completely cover her because I wanted you to be able to see her humanity. Um, I wanted her to be recognized um, as a person, as a woman. Um, so I didn't wanna cover up her facial features or her body completely. Um, it felt important to just sort of focused on sort of the breasts upwards. Um, and then the snakes, um, I, wanted, I wanted them to look like they were growing outside of her, um, but also sort of in this protective way where um, they, are, they, they resemble um, this idea that they are protecting, uh, protecting the figure. Okay. So I wanted to spend a minute um, talking about the idea of failure. Um, I was really inspired by a few things um, that I heard Kasia Sosnowski talk about in her artist talk, because um, she'd also done a residency at Medalta. And um, I made a few connections to specific things that she mentioned um, because I had also experienced them during my own residency um, and they were super powerful moments. So. Failure is a really hard thing to deal with at the time, um, but it's such an important thing to go through in terms of working with clay, not only to sort of expand on your, or on my material understanding, um, but also I learned a good lesson about pushing myself too hard in the studio. So that top image there where there's a big hole at the back of her arm is a direct result of me 
um, going back to the studio after a long day of work, um, knowing that I was already too tired, but the figure was literally five minutes away from completion. Um, but I just, and I just wanted to finish it. Um, that turned out to be a huge mistake uh, because she fell off of her support onto my studio table and I was alone in the studio. And luckily somehow uh, in some magical moment, um, I was able to lift her back onto her support, but her arm completely flew off. Um, she also landed in a water dish that I had on my studio table. So when I picked her up, it was also sort of this comical thing about me pouring water all over myself um, while I'm, I'm struggling and um, extremely upset at the same time that I thought I had ruined this piece. So that was a really important lesson in terms of <laughs> developing more of a, a work-life balance um, to being in the studio. And as well, the other images um, were more about learning about the different ways of combining um, different approaches with clay. So I had mostly hand-built everything, but when I first started working with the braids, I was slip casting them, um, which ended up not working with uh, the slab built base underneath. So everything ended up cracking completely. And I spent hours and hours meticulously fixing all of the cracks and the popped pieces <laughs> only to put them in the kiln and then have uh, the other piece uh, that it was facing have an air bubble that I didn't know and burst off and then break all of that work that I spent hours fixing. So um, as much as I, as I revel in the successes of working with the material, there's so much value for me in terms of those moments of failure um, for, for learning and doing things differently and um, taking a rest when I need to. But I'm just oh. going to, I'm going to jump in really quickly and say yeah. we have about 10 minutes. So oh, I'm, I'm, okay. I, post, post marking that. Okay, so then I'll skip. I'm sorry, um, I got really excited to go through all those. So I'll just move quickly through some of these because this is still during the first residency and I haven't gotten to the second half. Quickly, this is obviously pre-COVID times. Um, other awesome thing about the residency was the time that we got to spend with the other artists sharing space and cooking meals together. So this is the second residency experience at Medalta. I just started this past September. Uh, I'm now in the middle uh, of a year long residency. So at this point, I am here to finish uh, the work for the Esker show and start and complete the additional elements to go in the installation space. So I wanted to make these large scale flowers to go along the wall um, of the project space at the Esker. So this is me um, in the process of figuring out how to build these large scale flowers. Um, and you can see sort of that similar idea of an internal structure um, involved in the process of hand building these. And then the end result there um, is the color palette of working with these beautiful sort of yellows and pinks um, that I enjoyed working with. Okay, and then here are the snakes um, that you see on the floor of the exhibition. Uh, these were super fun to make. Uh, they are coil built um, with a slip cast head. I uh, made these really long extruded coils, which were super fun to work uh, and play around with in terms of building um, the form of the snake. I made quite a few of them um, to sort of cover the bottom of the gallery. And you can see um, on the end there, they're just freshly bisque fired snakes um, on their shrink pads, which helps support them in the process of firing um, so that uh, you tend to avoid cracks um, and any sort of shifts in the material if you include these shrink pads, which are also made out of the same clay, um, to go underneath the piece in the kiln. Okay, um, big thing for me, new glaze life. I've said it many times in the studio. Um, I was adamantly sort of opposed to working with um, glazes. I know a lot of that was connected to the fact that I was intimidated by the process of making glazes um, because I'm not, um, I wasn't familiar with it, but through the gentle pushing um, and expertise of my studio mates, I decided to step into this new world of making my own glazes and super fun adventure, super successful. Um, I really love the process of making glazes. 
As well, I wanted to acknowledge um, my new airbrush because this is the tool of my dreams. Um, again, this is me um, investing in myself in a, in a tool that has basically changed my life in terms of finishing pieces. So again, this is sort of another few examples of glaze testing. These are gonna be connected to uh, future work, but loving the process of playing around with making glazes. Um, and then just one more example of a failure there with the snake that's sort of flat, the cobra that's flat on the end. Um, I, I, I think I was a little too cocky in terms of um, my skills in hand building or in the process of firing it anyways. Um, it, it didn't survive as well as I thought it would. So it was just another moment of failure reminding me that clay is the ultimate winner in terms of who knows best. <laughs> okay. Um, one quick note, again, my studio mates are super inspiring. I've stepped outside of my comfort zone and this is a tiny experiment with the clay body that I've never worked with before. Um, and that is a direct result of the amazing people that I share the studio space with me, encouraging me to try new things. And I'm thankful for that. Um, this is the final glaze um, on the snakes. Happenstance um, was super happy with it. And there's a little bit of magic thrown into the mix in terms of this final result, um, but it compels me to continue experimenting with glaze in the future because it's such a fun process. And the fact that the results can change between even the test tiles to the final pieces um, is something that I'm super interested in uh, moving forward and playing around with in future work. Here is the inspiration um, for the hair on the piece. I love Marco's wigs. I follow them on Instagram. Um, they do amazing work. Uh, normally, um, I would just sort of place the hair um, onto the top of the head, but I wanted more of a, a stylistic approach to doing the hair in this piece. So um, this is sort of the inspiration um, that propelled me to finish the piece as I did. And so here's the process of me um, adding the wig hair onto it and then just a, a, a cute little silly smiley face um, on the top uh, there where the process of me having to build up the skull a little bit before adding the wig hair onto it. Um, it's a really meticulous process in terms of adding the hair onto the figure. Um, but I really enjoyed allowing also in terms of even already having an inspiration for the finished look of the hair, but allowing sort of the figure to direct and guide the placement of, uh, of the hair because I didn't want to cover too much of that flora uh, on the back of her head um, as well as on her shoulders. So this is how I worked um, in the last two weeks in Medalta. Um, I completely took over uh, the classroom space while I was putting the hair on it. So again, I'm really thankful for Medalta allowing me just to do my thing um, while I'm there because I completely covered these three desks um, while figuring out the process of working with the hair, how I was going to put it together um, and adhere it to the figure. So there are just a few close-ups um, of the hair as it was finished um, on the top there. I This was before I added the sort of additional pigtails, um, which came later. Uh, through this step-by-step -step process. Um, a lot of this, again, involved the piece sort of telling me what it needed and, and what it wanted. So just working through that as I was moving forward um, and not rushing through this process so that the final look um, was, was what I wanted or what, what I hoped for and fit well with the figure. So here we are at the Esker. Um, we have pre, um, me getting in there to install the beautiful white space. Um, and then the first step was to paint the Esker, this lovely shade of pink. Um, I wasn't sure about that um, originally, but I remember I was talking to Shada about it and uh, moving forward, painting the gallery space was the way to go. Um, and then we have the, the base and then the bottom half of the sculpture there. Um, the base was sort of the last thing to come together. Um, took me a little bit again to figure out how I wanted to cover the surface um, of the base, which is, is made of metal, um, which was lovely, uh, was handcrafted for me here in Redcliffe um, by an amazing team of, of welders here. Um, 
And it sort of harbens back to old ways of working in old materials, um, which was working with fun fur, which I had done in the past. So it was cool to have this kind of full circle thing happen in my practice um, in that I had stepped away from other materials to work solely with clay. But then at the end of the process of making this piece, I find myself coming back to old ways of working in old materials, which was a very cool thing um, to happen. So um, after the flowers were installed on the wall um, with the help uh, of Doug who made these amazing inserts for them to nicely just slide onto the wall um, as easy as pie and the pieces put together and in the space, um, these these hair snakes that I made, um, I wasn't 100% sure um, what they needed or where they were gonna go. And um, in terms of her positioning um, and the hands reaching forward in this sort of um, state of offering, the snakes at the last minute um, being wrapped around her fingers made the most sense and fit uh, well with the rest of the work and the way it was installed uh, in the space of the esker. Okay, and here we are. This is um, taken from the Esker's Instagram um, because when I was installing, there was a, a snowstorm in Calgary. I'd come from beautiful plus temperatures at Medicine Hat straight into a snowstorm here in Calgary. So um, I wasn't able to take any good photos of the final install, but this is um, the installation completed in the space at the Esker in the project space. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yvonne. That's amazing. And just to note, we were hoping to get it documented for this exhibition, but of course we had minus like 40 weather. So um, yeah. documentation, professional documentation is coming up for people who are interested who uh, maybe can't make it to see the work in person. Um, but thank you so much for that talk. It was so interesting and it's, it's so generous of you to kind of show us behind the scenes and to really walk us through the process, which is um, you know, something we see so rarely. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Um, we do have some questions, which uh, I will relay to you. Okay. Um, the first one, I'll kind of, there's, there were two questions about um, some of your influences. Um, Dick has the first question here. Um, Hello, Yvonne, thanks for your presentation. I'm, I'm curious as to any of your wider artistic influences. Some of these works appear as sculptural versions of Marigold Santos drawings. And there's also um, some rupture emblematic of the Sarah Ann Johnson sculpture of her grandmother. Are there any other artists you acknowledge as influences in terms of content? Um, well, I think early on, um, uh, Sherry Boyle has always been um, sort of a, a heavy influence um, in my work. I always loved, before I even got into clay, I, I loved her approach to making the figure um, and in sort of the content around the body um, and womanhood, which I always found engaging and recognized later moving forward in my own work that became a part of what I was interested in doing. Um, Marigold Santos, for sure. I'm lucky to have a tattoo of hers on, on my leg. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a big fan um, of her work. And so I, I appreciate that connection that, that Dick made. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, I also have sort of random outside influences, I guess, in terms of like fashion designers that uh, um, I have a book of Alexander McQueen sitting right in front of me. And I always uh, really sort of appreciated um, his work um, in terms of the fashion that he produced, but also the showmanship of the pieces that he made. Um, Nick Cave as well uh, has been an influence, um, I guess since art school. And those are the ones that honestly like stick out the most to me um, in terms of sort of references. But Louise Bourgeois also making this amazing connection, the first artist um, that I connected with um, during my AU arts days, who has forever been a muse and an inspiration and who will continue to always be, who I also feel amazingly lucky and humble to show along with at the same time at the Esker currently right now. Yeah. Sorry, just as an aside, it's interesting that you, um, you know, mentioned McQueen, uh, you know, because he, he spoke a lot about um, his garments as sort of like a, like armor for women. So kind yeah. of viewing the this sort of very elaborate layering of these materials on your figures in that way, I hadn't really thought about that, but that's an interesting, an interesting connection. Um, uh, and Yvonne had asked if uh, you have any influences in terms of folklore or old legends or 
anything like that that uh, informs your ideas. Or if, and if your uh, if your beautiful flowers have any symbolic meaning to you. Um, so folklore. Um, I know that growing up, folklore was something I inevitably you know read as a child. I I wouldn't say that specifically. I I've been thinking about that while making this work, um, but. I know that moving forward, that's becoming more of an interest, like folklore and mythology is something that I would um, like to explore more, uh, connect to um, in the work. The, the reference that I can mention specifically for this figure that sort of permeated its way into the work in terms of connecting, um, you know, this idea of the garden uh, and the snakes is, you know, the Eve reference is definitely um, part of the making of this work. Um, but not specifically any other uh, characters or stories from folklore that I I can connect to this exhibition. Okay, Sally asks, um, how do you find the balance, um, the structure that ceramics requires, as well as letting the work speak to you and guide you as you go? Are there certain times when you feel like you can let go of that structure slash rigidity and let the piece then guide you in aesthetic? Well, see, that's an interesting question um, because I'm I'm not specifically trained in ceramics. This was um, my my background is in sculpture. Uh, that's what I majored in at ACAD. So um, my exposure or skill base in clay is um, around the idea of me being self-taught. So I don't have those same guidelines um, because I don't know. I didn't train with the material in the same way that a, a ceramicist would. So I don't have that same base knowledge um, with the material. It's been me learning along the way. So often uh, I will do things that say maybe someone else wouldn't do because they know not to do that because the, the clay, if worked in this way, will do this or in combined with that glaze or you know this firing temperature will do this. Since I don't really have that knowledge, I just kind of push forward and do things um, as I see fit. And that obviously changes here and there with um, sort of this expanding knowledge that I'm gaining through more time spent in the studio working with clay. Um, but I definitely, it's always been important for me to sort of connect to that, that magic point or that intuitive um, moment where the work speaks to me and tells me what it wants. I'm really aware and open to that. So in the majority of the work that I do make, um, there is, a connection of letting go and letting the work tell me what it needs um, in that process. I've been thinking a little bit about um, about your work in relation to the Louise Bourgeois show upstairs and also um, Finn Simonetti's work. I mean, you know, we have all of these these prints upstairs, which hopefully at some point people will be able to come and see in relation to your work. But also, you know, kind of these prints stemming from her drawing practice, which was very much about like you know, this sort of almost repetitive, almost kind of compulsive um, sort of mark making. And when I look at your work and just like how detailed and how much you like return to making in this very like laborious process of, of sculpting, you know, flowers and texture and that kind of thing. And Louise is really using this and her whole kind of body of art making as, um, you know, kind of a way to work through trauma or navigate her emotional landscape and then you know, Finn Simonetti upstairs, kind of a similar thing. She, you know, turned to this very uh, labor intensive process of stone carving, um, you know, after the death of her father. And so she was working through, you know, their fraught relationship and her grief and that kind of thing. So I was, I was just thinking about, you know, you were talking about this, this sort of um, like personal kind of um, healing and kind of working through um, like, you know, your own personal sort of issues. And, and I'm just wondering if you, if you see a relationship between, you know, that kind of personal process and this, this physical kind of act of returning to and making and just sort of like covering and all of this, this really sort of detail oriented, um, you know, work that you're doing in terms of like, yeah, like healing or working through or like, what do you take from that process as, as much as you're kind of like giving back or the piece is speaking to you and you're kind of like, speaking to it I'm just I'm curious about like how that process works for you well what you said resonated pretty deeply um because I recognize this sort of um meticulous approach that I've undertaken over the last year in terms of working with clay and 
um, the layer of levels of detail in the flowers and it, adhering this flora to the surface of whether it's a vessel or, or the figure. Um, that is, it's such a meditative process for me. And I sort of abandon everything else that's going in the background. Um, I don't need to think or acknowledge any space around me other than, you know, my two hands and the clay in front of me. Um, and through that meditative process, I know that that's helped me move forward um, in terms of healing. Um, in general, I've always connected to process that's highly involved. I, um, I like I like a process where I really have to sit and focus in it. Um, I, I know that I have this sort of natural side that's really focused on attention to detail, but I recognize um, in terms of where I started in this um, return to my art practice and stepping into a space of healing um, that this, it, yeah, I guess I would think of it as mark making, this sitting down, this meticulous nature um, was a way that I could connect to healing inside of the studio as much as I was doing things outside of the studio to work through, you know, those feelings connected to grief and loss that um, it was essential to do that in a different way in the studio space with maybe not always acknowledging it being that way, but as you move through all these processes and to have this conversation with you right now um, and to have had this conversation, um, maybe it's sort of in similar ways outside of um, this moment with, uh, friends of mine, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely connected um, to healing, this process of mark making and focus on detail. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any, any questions? A lot of amazing work, excellent talk, beautiful. Thank you for sharing your mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. I mean, you don't see that very often, right? Like it's yeah. such, a, such an important thing to share. Part of me wishes that I had a video of that moment, but I don't think I would have. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if that's, if that's um, everything from the audience. Oh, question? One last one. one, last one. Uh, oh, here we go. Yes, sorry, I didn't scroll down far enough. Um, uh, I'm picturing you driving across that vast empty prairie space with the garden sculpture beside you. The piece must be fragile. How did you transport her? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, um, I made two trips from Medicine Hat to Calgary uh, to bring the work to the Esker. The first trip was just um, the installation elements, so the flowers and the snakes. Um, <laughs> now, it, <laughs> I, it, it was it's kind of funny to think about it now because I, you know, I don't have them in crates and I didn't have them packed in a way. They were just layers of foam. Um, and my car and me in the road, uh, bringing them back to <laughs> the back. Um, though the top piece was a little bit different. So the figure came, um, she's obviously in two pieces. Um, uh, and the legs sat in the front seat, leaned up against the passenger seat. Um, and the top part, my partner had made a nice little box for it to rest on. And then layers and layers and layers of foam jamming it into safe space, <laughs> a secure space in my trunk, basically of my, my Mazda uh, CX-5. Um, and I also sat in the back seat, um, sort of holding, supporting, watching just to, you know, in case we hit a bump or a quick turn just to hold her. But uh, that process, that, that um, supports that we had built just was able to bring her to Calgary safely. Um, I was also sitting with the big metal um, base um, in the back seat with me. Uh, so it was quite the adventure in terms of bringing it back. <laughs> I have to say, it's like I held my breath a little bit when you opened like the back hatch of your car. Oh, yeah. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> the whole process of moving the work, uh, even from the studio space to my car, it just like panic inducing at every sort of turn. But I feel like it made me stronger going through that. Um, <laughs> So it was, yeah, no, it was, it was a good experience as heart wrenching as it was. Um, and it made it to Calgary safely, which was great. Yes. All in one piece. Okay. Oh, oh gosh. Scroll down, scroll down. Uh, lots of, lots of lovely comments. I think that's it for questions though. Uh, yeah. So we're getting to about quarter past. So this might be a good place to wrap it up then. Okay. Right. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to ramble. I know I extended some parts of it longer than I should have, but. Oh no, it was super interesting. Don't apologize at all. Thank you so much for being with us and having this talk tonight. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity very much. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, Have a wonderful, safe, lovely evening. Bye. Bye. I feel like there should be applause.